the most vexing element in Congress in the 1970s and 1980s was the issue of undocumented Mexican migration. And it took over 13 years of congressional debates and political grandstanding to craft a response to the problems of prohibited migration. The Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, united diverse interests but did little to sh slow undocumented immigration. And as scholars have documented, the act penalized the knowing employment of the undocumented and it established a new requirement that citizenship or work eligibility be proven upon starting a new job. And further, it gave permanent resident status to undocumented immigrants who had resided in the United States for at least five years and to undocumented immigrants with 90 days or more of work in perishable agriculture. And finally, it provided a means by which agricultural enterprises could recruit documented immigrants through the implementation of what are known as H-2A visas. And although the act succeeded in legalizing the status of long-term undocumented immigrants already in the United States, in fact, those on the right today who revere Ronald Reagan as a demigod must appreciate that this Republican president took the bold step of offering amnesty to the undocumented. But it was an unsuccessful act in discouraging new undocumented immigrants from immigrating. Why? Well, employers continued to knowingly hire undocumented immigrants. And as Baldemar Velasquez, president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, so eloquently argues today, for every undocumented worker, there is an undocumented employer. And in part in response to pressures from employer organizations and chambers of commerce, the nation was unwilling and unable to enforce the employer sanction provisions of the act. Some employers were fined, but very few were jailed. And Congress drafted the law in such a way as to offer employers an easy excuse. And as long as they had no reason to believe that the documents that the new employees presented were false, they could not be prosecuted for employing the undocumented. Employer ignorance led to a market of false documents, and it assured an underground network of cheap labor for business. So coupled with the desire to regulate the formation and control of labor forces in the United States were multinational corporations yearning to usher in a new model of capitalist accumulation in the Western Hemisphere. As U.S., Western European, and Asian Pacific firms searched for cheap labor and maximum profit during the border industrialization program of the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, the Miquiladoras provided a, a valuable blueprint for the expansion throughout Latin America. Now, as Gonzalez emphasizes in Chapter 13 in the 1980s and 1990s, the United States led a worldwide campaign for quote-unquote free trade. And during the 1980s and 1990s, two new vocabulary words entered the foreign policy lexicon, neoliberalism and the Washington Consensus. Now, neoliberalism and the Washington Consensus are strategies adopted by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. So U.S. foreign policy under the presidencies of George Bush the Sr. and Bill Clinton pressed developing nations, especially Mexico and Central America, to lower tariffs on imported goods and to create new export-oriented manufacturing zones, largely to serve the needs of multinational corporations. So neoliberalism, otherwise known as the Washington Consensus in foreign policy, through military prowess, coerced Latin American nations to massively sell off its public assets, to privatize its basic government services, and to submit national governments to the financial and trade dictates of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. So this free trade model was first implemented here in North America and was sold to the American public as a solution to poverty, jobs, and immigration dilemmas. The North American Free Trade Agreement promised prosperity for everyone. Canada, the United States, and Mexico entered into a permanent economic union that allowed multinational corporations to control Mexico's manufacturing, agricultural, and banking industries. 
But neoliberalism in the guise of free trade agreements brought instead unprecedented social inequalities, the immiseration and displacement of tens, if not hundreds of millions of popular classes throughout Latin America. NAFTA drove so many small Mexican manufacturers and farmers out of business that millions of people were dislocated and unemployment mushroomed. Thus, instead of reducing the pressure on Mexicans to migrate to the United States, NAFTA increased it. Let's go to a documentary that was sponsored by the Teamsters Union. Let's listen to the debate in Congress during Son of a Bush's reign on what to do with NAFTA 10 years after and whether the Central American Free Trade Agreement should be implemented. Let's go to 10 years of broken promises by the Teamsters Union. There is a face to free trade and to NAFTA. And that face, at least in, in Juarez, and I think all along the border with Mexico and other parts of Latin America, that face is in anguish. These trade agreements do not benefit poor people in Mexico. Here we were at the border, where on one side of the border, there are workers who are paid probably 10 times at least more than workers on the other side of the border for the same job. And of course that's why American companies and others want to cross the border so that they can pay people a non-living wage. And that's what I saw. NAFTA has resulted in the exploitation of the Mexican worker, the loss of jobs here in this country, and the only ones who have benefited quite frankly, are these multinational corporations which are engaged in this exploitation. We do have a basis by which to judge the free trade agreements, and that basis is 10 years of NAFTA. And the expectations and the promises and the guarantees about what NAFTA was going to do not only for our country, but for, for Mexico in particular, they haven't occurred. My visit to Mexico uh, was an absolute eye-opener. Uh, I've shared that with my constituents and others, and they just said, why are we doing these things? Ten years ago, the people in Mexico truly thought they had a bright future ahead of them, and now their stories are devastating. What you're really touching on is the unintended consequences of globalization and the moronic belief that while it is bad for American workers, that somehow it is good for poor people all over the world, that we are raising their standard of living. And what we saw in Mexico is clearly that is not the case. We have seen American jobs go to Mexico. And in turn, we haven't seen uh, the life of the Mexican worker improve. Actually, the standard of living of the average worker in Mexico has gone down. And I had heard of the effects of NAFTA on, on the Mexican worker, uh, but it wasn't until I saw it with my own eyes and actually talk to the people who are suffering this exploitation that I realized how evil this, this system is. It's something that we should be ashamed of. And, and when I say that, I, I, I indict the president, I indict the Congress, and I'm part of that process, certainly. No one said that the idea of NAFTA was for American corporations to move out of America, go across the Rio Grande and build a factory, exploit the Mexican workers, and then ship back in here to sell their products. That wasn't what we were told. We were told they are dying to buy our refrigerators. They're dying to buy our cars. They want the American dream. They want our televisions. None of that happened. Well, we had a CEO of a company come in, make all kinds of promises, and within two years, uh, most of those workers are gone today. The company got everything they wanted from the Congress, and in fact, the workers got the shaft. The people who are proposing these trade agreements could care less about the average American, could care less about poor people in the developing world. They're in it for one thing and one thing alone, that is to increase the profits of the company. The race to the bottom in, in countries where the American corporations are going in and fighting, not for the future, but fighting for this quarter so that their profit statements look good, so their numbers on Wall Street go up, so that they personally make a lot of money today. When the NAFTA deal was being proposed, uh, 
the business community did all of the right things to sell NAFTA. I can remember um, knowing how powerful they were and deep down really resenting it. I really, really felt their power, but I knew what we were up against because I didn't have the money to get on those morning talk shows on Sunday morning as they did. I was actually denied the ability to go onto those programs and speak my piece because Archer Daniel Midland and the proponents of NAFTA sponsored the time. So then I really understood for the first time as a member of Congress how powerful they really were. And we should not barter away uh, the livelihood of workers to the benefit of a few greedy corporations. I can tell you the next time a CEO testifies before my committee or any committee of the Congress, I'm not going to listen to what they tell us. I'm going to look, look at what they have done. And uh, the CEOs of the major corporations, in particular the manufacturing corporations in the United States today, do not have a very good track record of keeping their word. What they have a good track record at is trying to increase their profits on the backs of workers. Okay, so again, students said what we have learned throughout the course is that labor unions have had little conflicts or have had conflicts with undocumented workers. And many times unions sided with management to keep immigrants in an unfavorable position. Unions have never tr trusted capitalists due to the use of immigrants as strike breakers. Now, unions in the United States have never favored the unskilled immigrant worker. And furthermore, American unions have always disdained the undocumented worker. The North American Free Trade Agreement opened the eyes of organized labor in the United States and challenged unions to take a side. I mean, which side are you on, unions? Are unions going to go back, or are unions going to back the foreign policy objectives of the United States and accept the neoliberal wages offered to Latin American people, a wage a war ensuring capitalist profiteering, or are unions going to take the side of the exploited and recognize job remuneration in the United States is based on how poorly paid other workers in Latin America are. We will end this class with the impact of neoliberalism on the U.S. worker and immigrants, and we will try to understand the United States' fixation with the Muslim terrorists. Thank you.